All right, welcome everybody. Um, happy holidays. Daniel here back again for probably our last podcast of the season. I'm very happy to welcome a uh, professor of philosophy at uh, Erasmus Rotterdam in the Netherlands, uh, Sjord van Tuinen. Van Tuinen? Van Tuinen, is that uh, correct? Sjord van Tuinen, but I know it's impossible. For Americans. Um, okay, welcome everyone. So today we are gathered to discuss um, whether the Nietzschean concept of resentment is a liberal concept at the end of the day. Now, the um, subtitle I've given to to this conversation may may be actually s surprising for some people. And I think it is surprising in the sense that uh, resentment has become such a uh, loaded and highly charged concept that it seems to me at least that um, uh, either people invoke it to refer to uh, a generalized condition of kind of a generalized condition of the worker in capitalism or of um, any condition of envy or jealousy towards the other but most often when it is invoked in political discourse it's invoked to demonize a one's opponent and to relegate one's opponent to a kind of ontological condition whereby they're not um, eligible for solidarity on the one hand they're not um, part of the community project that one is championing in other words, when you um, identify a group, an individual, etc., as of resentment, it assigns a type of ontological impossibility about them even exiting such a condition. And so after Nietzsche, many philosophers have uh, proposed a number of different ways of thinking about this concept. And so I'm very happy to have uh, Short with us because he has written incredible essays and he has a forthcoming book on resentment. Um, so I want to just welcome you to the show and just maybe we could start by, could you give us a sense of the kind of uh, philosophy that you practice and some of your research interests? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Daniel, for, uh, for having me. Uh, there is a short delay, so apologies if I manage to interrupt you at some point or miss something. But, um, <clears throat> well, generally I come from, uh, from um, I suppose, a background in French philosophy. Uh, that's also what I teach mostly. Um, and uh, since a number of years, actually already quite long, uh, on, a, on, an, on an on and off basis, I've been working on this book that is forthcoming with Routledge in September called um, The Dialectic of Ressentiment, Pedagogy of a Concept. And this book, well, it's about many of the discourses that you've already touched upon in your introduction. The, it's basically a book about, not so much about, um, I don't know, an interpretation of the world or, or the con contemporary conjuncture through the notion of ressentiment rather than uh, an archaeology of the different uses of the concept. So, what I try to do is show a certain continuity in a certain way with, uh, of using the concept of ressentiment from the mid uh, 19th century up to today, uh, but also show very different subject positions in this discourse, very different usages, and how in a way there is a dialectical relation between these usages in the sense that one follows more or less polemically from the other, one response to the other. Uh, and in this way, I try to show kind of the systematicity of this, um, that this discourse as a whole, which I believe only really becomes feasible if you really do this archaeological uh, labor of the concept where, um, yeah, you basically try to cover, if I succeed or not, uh, well, we, well, it's not only up to me to decide, but to at least to try to cover all the possible subject positions that we can find. 
with a little bit in the way that Foucault would say that uh, when he went to the library, uh, 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 you know, he would tell, he would say like, yeah, I'm just going to verify that people were really saying what they, what they should be saying at mm -hmm. a certain point. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, I received some funding for it uh, a while ago, uh, many years ago, actually. Funding is already long dried up, but the project is still going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, and one of the things that always struck me was that, um, and this is in reference to to what you were saying about the contemporary uh, topicality of this notion of ressentiment, is that people always say, "Oh, that's so topical, that's so relevant, that's so important. We need to look at this more." And then my response is always, "Well, that's not really how I, <laughs> not really the intuition that guided me, because for me." Uh, it's, to me, it seems like ressentiment has been an evergreen in uh, certain types of uh, moral psychology or uh, indeed liberal or political philosophy, uh, at least since uh, Hippolyte Ten in France in the mid 19th, 19th century. And then, of course, Max Scheler in Germany, um, René Girard in France, uh, but also lots of North American political theory. So it's kind of always been in the air mm -hmm. and that probably has something to do that probably also shows its limitations in the sense that it mm -hmm. is a little bit too ahistorical mm -hmm. to really do the work that it is uh, said to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe that's why I think it's more interesting to look indeed at the ideological performances of the concept rather than its explanatory value, although I do think it has some. Um, mm -hmm. And... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, that also, in a way, uh, to, to preempt your, your question, is it a liberal concept? Uh, mostly, yes, except that, that I think the Nietzschean take on the sentiment uh, is from that, and um, in many ways is an anti-liberal interpretation, but um, yeah, I'm sure we will get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, that's very helpful. I mean, I think you've hit on a number of good themes, which is there's an ahistorical component to the concept. On the one hand, there's also a lack of uh, an awareness that any time one declares another to be of resentment, they perform a certain exclusionary logic. They reproduce, they re reproduce some kind of thing. Now, the historical pinpoint of the the concept is a modern concept. Yes, it's 19th century, sure. But my argument from a Marxist point of view would be that historically it tends to refer, at least in European political thought, to any effort by a plebeian proletarian underclass from the possible achievement of its own justice or of its own emancipation. So immediately you see that the problem becomes, uh, the concept becomes a problem for the left, right? Because if that's true, then the left must either A, reject it completely because it would present an impediment to the possible universal rationalist emancipation of proletarian, uh, or B, the left would have to accept it as a condition of for itself and work through it in that sense uh you kind of need freud to uh show that the various ambivalent libidinal attachments and repressions of everyday life necessitate a psychoanalytic working through right so so you immediately do not want to uh become an ultra leftist to some some kind of beautiful soul and say uh we reject it completely it needs to be worked with it needs to be worked with uh but what does it name maybe we could start what you know what does it name why why and this is an obvious question uh you know why why not use the term resentment hmm? you see immediately that it signifies and qualifies something greater than mere resentment right and that's very significant to to me precisely because 
if we call it resentment, a more ordinary affect, right? Uh, immediately you see that it's non-ontologizing to the other. Hmm? You immediately have a kind of possibility of change. Like you think, for example, of the leftist who says, well, uh, we, meet, we must work with workers who expressed racist attitudes precisely because if we work with the, them in the class struggle, we can convert their racism. We can change it. We can transform it. But if we call the worker of resentment, then we have barred that possibility of transformation. You see, this is my hesitation with the concept because we still live in the class struggle today. Yes, the proletariat is not what it was in Marx's time, but I think it's reasonable to argue that capitalism overall is going to locate the problem of resentment amongst what Nietzsche would call the losers, right? The, the, now, of course, he can develop a whole uh, analysis which conceals the fact that he's speaking of the working class ultimately, which Lukács and Lucerto and other Marxist critics of Nietzsche will say, of course, that he is, yeah? in a trans historical way, right? From Socrates all the way up to Paris Commune. So this is my hesitation with the concept, right? This is my hesitation. And it's interesting because a lot of people on the left, and maybe you could just tell me if you agree, they don't really see that hesitation or they don't, they don't have that same hesitation with the concept, you know, it, because it is such a, um, commonsensical idea of liberal politics, you know? So the fact that you're working on this and you're bringing a certain, you know, skepticism to the concept, I think is very healthy for our, for our political discourse. <laughs> yeah, no, um, let, let me, let me respond to that. I think, uh, I totally endorse your doubts, <clears throat> your hesitation, um, for the same reason. And it's something I, I struggle with as well. Uh, uh, in a way, you know, how to interpolate the, what Nietzsche calls the man of ressentiment, <clears throat> let's call them the person of ressentiment, uh, in such a way that, um, yeah, they don't immediately just react, reject your interpolation and deepen their positions uh, in, in a way. And this is really um, <clears throat> a challenge. Um, and... Um, well, from a Nietzschean point of view, I'm not talking about the, the, the majority of the discourses available on Ressentiment, because indeed they don't have this reflective layer about the uh, about the the impact their discourse has upon uh, on, on those it concerns. Uh, there's a generally, I would say, there's a lack of reflexivity. There's a kind of stupidity to the, the use of the concept of Ressentiment in the sense that. Uh, the statement of its truth does not make any difference to the situation. Uh, it has nothing to contribute. In a way, it deepens it, it consolidates it. Um, this is what Nietzsche would call, uh, or at least this is part, I think, of what Nietzsche called a pastoral uh, discourse. Um, uh, the, the, the reason I think that uh, Nietzsche doesn't, he doesn't talk much about ressentiment. Huh? You have to remember the concept only in the genealogy of morality after uh, he's been reading Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground. That's where he gets it from, uh, because the ressentiment is the way it is features as a word four times in the French translation in which he, uh, Nietzsche read that book. Um, so that's the context that this, uh, and Dostoevsky is not just talking about the condition of workers, uh, necessarily at least. Um, he is talking about a general corruption, I would say, of uh, uh, of public life. Of uh, he, he's talking from a kind of romantic, pessimistic position. It's, a, it's part of his critique of modernity. He, well, he's trying to live up to the Delphic motto of knowing himself, uh, trying to be as harsh, giving as harsh a self-portrait as possible, um, based on 
um, a profound skepsis also of the very possibility of doing that, of achieving the, the, the necessary authenticity to talk about, about himself. Um, in that kind of context, uh, resentment as a, is, can never be as straightforward uh, a political effect as the liberal theory from Adam Smith and Joseph Butler onwards to have, have tended to, to present it. So that's has much to do already uh, starting with the reading of Dostoevsky with a critique uh, of the, yeah, of the um, various legitimations of resentment that uh, the kind of rationalizations of resentment that liberal theory has to offer. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so, so I would say uh, a liberal theory, when it legitimizes resentment, I also don't think they are necessarily talking about the working class. <laughs> this is about uh, the bourgeoisie amongst itself. Right? You need more than just sympathy or pity or whatever. You need, also need resentment if you want to assert your rights. You need a certain tit for tat. You need to be able to, you need some kind of, um, 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 and kind of um, what is it? Balance, it's balance, and rationalization, right? Um, <clears throat> and balance that always needs to be restored in in society. Now, uh, if this discourse of resentment, in a way, uh, is already um, empowering, let's say, the bourgeois revolution, French Revolution, uh, and in this sense becomes hegemonic. It becomes problematic the moment that a new class appears, which kind of uh, goes beyond and against um, uh, the universal ideals uh, or that contests the universality of the bourgeois ideals of liberty, uh, equality and fraternity. Um, and um, that and whose resentment then suddenly also needs to be disqualified. That's the moment when ressentiment appears. So I understand so in this regard, it's not resentment, but ressentiment that is particularly used to address uh, the working class. But I'm not sure if Nietzsche would agree with that. Uh, Nietzsche, for example, will say when Dostoevsky talks about his fellow inmates in a prison, in his labor camps in Siberia, uh, that there's no ressentiment there. Right? These people, uh, they don't have the time. <laughs> they don't have the reflexive, the, the luxury of reflection uh, to even start, uh, you know, um, uh, victim, uh, uh, perceiving themselves as victims of their situation, of uh, of blaming others, etc. No, he says no. They they are hardened by punishment, and that's precisely why ressentiment and bad conscience, as a further higher development of ressentiment, don't occur there. Ressentiment is typically something that occurs among uh, the petit bourgeoisie or the middle classes who are always afraid of losing what they already have and proletariat has nothing there's nothing to lose so therefore uh, ressentiment does not apply to them i think mm. even Nietzsche uh, might agree with that analysis yeah i i i would jump in to say um that it is the problem of the socialist intellectual or the modern priest in all of its different avatars who performs a kind of transmission of resentment downward that disturbs uh, their hardness and for which, which is why uh, in reflecting on uh, who uh, his disciples may be, Nietzsche says who, who his disciples may be, he says, um, uh, if they were a Socratic disciple, a disciple of the priest, they would not be able to handle the extremity of suffering that's required to be my disciple, yeah? because they get lost in their own extreme suffering. So you see immediately, and I think even in Deleuze's ethics from Logic of Sense, as well as his books on, a book on Nietzsche, you see immediately that the question is, Nietzsche gives us a way of a kind of what I would call an ethical management of uh, prudential management of, of, of suffering. In that sense, I think that's why Deleuze sees him as a superior philosopher of 
uh, the management of suffering, whether that be construed as a social class or as an individual, is almost neither here nor there. I think for Lukács and Losurdo, and let's say for a more classical Marxist critique of Nietzsche, I think what they want to point out is that Nietzsche's praxis, Nietzsche's Ubermensch, Nietzsche's community building strategies, the philosophers of the future, hmm? um, necessitated the refinement of aesthetic suffering. So precisely modernity after French Revolution and the promotion of uh, priestly notions of equality constitute a problem because um, they don't know how to properly manage human suffering. And they don't know how to wield, or in a psychoanalytic sense, they don't know how to sublimate it properly in some ways. So in that sense, Nietzsche becomes a kind of um, perverse educator back to the left. And the left needs to make a decision there. Because I think you, Nietzsche's you vision of politics and vision of society is one in which that priestly mediation to proletariat, who, like you said, he does not recognize as in an ontological condition of resentment, unless they have been discursively told that they are, then it becomes an issue in some sense, right? So you can see immediately why Nietzsche is an, a perverse educator to the left, even though he wants their suffering to be to remain in my, what I say is muted. He wants he wants that suffering to remain uh, content. Yeah, which is why he hated John Stuart Mill's book on socialism, precisely because liberal socialist utilitarians were the biggest culprits of this um, misunderstanding about the measurements of how to manage suffering. You know what I mean? Uh, so it's his critique of utilitarianism there, ultimately. And that's why I think Marxists have... Uh, 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 perceived a kind of openness to Nietzsche there, which we need to be very honest and sober about that uh, dialogue. Hmm? And I notice in your reading your work that you you have your limits with Nietzsche. You you have points where you say we cannot reproduce certain aspects of Nietzsche's. So maybe now we're jumping into Nietzsche. We can we can dig in. Um, I don't know if you wanted to say a bit more about that. <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Rancière's book, uh, Hatred of Democracy. Uh, I think uh, there you get the most um, precise and a critique, in a way, of uh, of contemporary um, discourses on ressentiment which always come from the side of uh, the, the management of suffering, right? Or rather the management of the limitlessness of desire that would be triggered by democracy and also make it uh, um, eat it up from the inside, so to speak. So the, the government of, um, <clears throat> of suffering as a way to protect democracy from itself uh, that's very much uh, what's going on these days, and and that's actually what what has been going on for the past one and a half century, I think. Uh, I do need to think that Nietzsche has a different version of that, um, but he will not say, you know, Nietzsche. He, he will say, of course, he he has a medicalizing discourse. So in that regard, he comes close to the. The priests, the, the, the governors um, of suffering, the interpreters, the, 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 the mediators of suffering. Um, but his idea of medicine is, of course, not that we need to protect the weak against themselves or the, sla the, 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 the slaves uh, against the strong, etc. Uh, we need to protect the strong, the exceptional, the, the possible breakthroughs, maybe even revolutionary moments in this regard, uh, precisely from, let's say, uh, um, the, 
what he calls the slave revolt, which is basically not just an event in history. It's, it's definitely not a proletarian revolution. It's precisely uh, everything that makes sure that the revolution never really takes place. So in that sense, Nietzsche is a perverse uh, educator for the left because he 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 wants to show he wants to teach us why the the, the reactive life always prevails in different forms and in different shapes uh, throughout history um and uh, under which which conditions uh something else some new strength uh could be born uh, and for Nietzsche, it is very clear that these these categories of noble and slave or strength and weakness or health and sickness uh, they do not correspond to empirical um, descriptors. Uh, they do not correspond, for Nietzsche at least, he says that, he always emphasizes that they, 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 they do not correspond to, let's say, class distinctions or gender and, 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 and uh, <clears throat> I would say race, but race, of course, is already a bit more difficult because that's a concept that he actually uses for himself. Um, so Nietzsche as a perverse educator for the left, uh, I think it's a very, very well, uh, it's a very apt description um, of what is the only way in which we can still read Nietzsche, because in all other respects, he would be unbearable. Uh, and I do think that Losurdo, uh, but he follows Lukács in this, has said the last words in this regard. If you read Nietzsche, uh, let's say, too historically, as they do, then he's useless. So it's always about something that has to escape from history. Um, and, you know, what escapes from, well, uh, uh, Klosowski and Deleuze put this very nicely, of course. Uh, this is what Lasurdo calls the, the, the hermeneutics of innocence when it comes to, to Nietzsche. But they say, uh, you know, they have always emphasize what Nietzsche himself uh, in his later works often says, already in the gay science, I think. Eh? Only extreme cases count. Only what, only what is exceptional, only what escapes historical conditions, only um, yeah, what escapes the, 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 the training and the taming uh, of suffering or the reactive forces, um, although it is conditioned by it. That is what interest, what's interesting, what, legit, what can legitimate suffering. Um, so that's a very different understanding of, uh, of management. Um, it, it, because it means that um, it is never a question of empirical management. It's never a question of managing what exists uh, uh, within empirical boundaries. It's always uh, the management of something that, uh, yeah, that does not yet exist because it would uh, exceed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so in this regard, I would really emphasize that, that the proletarian revolution is precisely what is not the slave revolt for Nietzsche. Mm. Um, uh, maybe neither was Spartacus or uh, mm. other moments of breakthrough. You can, Nietzsche allows you to explain, maybe not in, the, in terms of a solid historical materialist class analysis, but he still allows you to explain in a more, uh, in a different métier, uh, why precisely these revolutions have never occurred or why their mode of existence is that they, yeah, that they're always around the corner but never become actualized or when or when something had just happened it immediately dissipates and gets regulated adapted into something else um yeah i would say i would say that i agree to to your notion that nietzsche does not provide mm -hmm. Or that, uh, and you see this, of course, in Deleuze as well, uh, which is why Deleuze can, and Foucault for that matter, um, can can reconstruct uh, a conception of history that is not um, tethered to to revolutions as such. Like for Foucault, the um, 1848 Paris Commune and so on are not um, what necessarily break epistemes yeah so uh that's a very nietzschean 
gesture of historiography and historicism and so on. However, where we do see, in my view, some empirical claims at work is, of course, you know, Malcolm Bull's anti-Nietzsche book, which I, I have problems with. But I think one point that I like is that it was the issue of egalitarian egalitarianism and precisely of equality. So what makes the um, difficulty of a revolution, a slave revolt in Nietzsche's sense, from truly succeeding, truly having what Gramsci calls a moment of true catharsis, um, is, the, is, the, is the introduction, and Bull shows this in relation to French Revolution in careful detail, uh, because Nietzsche was a great reader of the sequences of the French Revolution. And he saw that um, when full equality, right, when full egalitarianism was uh, introduced, that in that sense, the revolution had had completely collapsed in some sense. And so immediately, what I think is interesting as a provocation for for us to think about is is the idea of what equality in fact is because one of the things that situates neo the era of neoliberal capitalism is the fact that neoliberal capitalism has for several decades now um trained us to uh have a a, a fundamental skepticism to the idea of equality that's very different than 19th century liberal capitalism right where equality was in fact uh, a kind of ideal right so i wonder if you might say something about this and i know that you write about this as well which is part of the skepticism that we need to have towards resentment itself today is the question of what equality is today in some sense right because i do think that nietzsche wants to say something that something like that uh and is it equality as such for Nietzsche that must be, you know, uh, rejected? I think that it would be. Uh, and I think that Losoto does show without necessarily canceling Nietzsche, because keep in mind, Losoto, towards the end of his text, says, look, uh, Nietzsche has a theoretical, sur what he calls a theoretical surplus, which means that, uh, yes, uh, if you situate his trans historical effort as highly empirically charged in his own time, hmm? like you said, well, then you kind of discard Nietzsche entirely. That's not what Losurdo says. Losurdo says that Nietzsche actually still remains. So does Jeff Waite. That's why the task is more to follow the, the surplus of Nietzscheanism, both as a cultural phenomenon, you know, uh, in liberal society, as well as on the left in all of its different variations on the left, right? Uh, what is the continuity? What is the consistency of Nietzscheanism within the left is a big uh, question for me, you know? Um, and I don't want to say that it's always one thing because it's not, because you have Nietzschean post-colonial thought. You have Nietzsche within Black Panthers. You have, you know, socialist Nietzscheans. You have anarchist Nietzscheans. It's too, uh, heterogeneous, you know, to discard it like that, but it needs to be critically analyzed. I know I've get, I've said a lot, but maybe we could return to the question on equality to see your thoughts. Yeah, no, no, I, I, but I, I think I agree with everything you say. I actually forgot this notion of surplus uh, of theory that, uh, that um, Maybe say, of course, uh, Nietzsche is a is a radically inegalitarian thinker. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Um, but uh, that's not necessarily where ressentiment comes in, because I mean, initially ressentiment, uh, the way Nietzsche describes it, is um, he calls it an incapacity to forget or. Uh, it, it, he describes it as a kind of uh, a Kleinian split, 
uh, between the evil other and uh, the good me, so to speak. And, and so it, it has a very different, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think a very different um, genealogy initially for, for Nietzsche. And, and then he's going to show how, and then he's going to say, well, this is uh, uh, this notion, uh, um, this marks the, the, the beginning of the slave revolt. And this is how the slave revolt in morality begins, he says. The slave revolt in morality, of course, because is, the, is, is what he understands as democratic culture, uh, kind of secularized uh, version of Christianity, uh, egalitarianism. Uh, that's how it begins, but it takes uh, many, many steps. Huh? It needs to pass through many hands, many geniuses, as he will say. First, a Jewish priest, a Christian priest, then uh, modernity, until we finally arrive at the connection between ressentiment and egalitarianism. Uh, this is precisely not, of course, how uh, uh, disciples of Nietzsche, who are, you know, false disciples are terrible, in any case, the, the, the right Nietzschean, so to speak, like Sheila, have, uh, have used the concept of ressentiment, and they will say, no, Nietzsche was wrong to attack Christianity as basically what, uh, what um, prepared egalitarian culture, it is precisely, and, and the culture of ressentiment, and uh, it is precisely modernity, modern idea, regulative ideals of egalitarian, uh, of equality, that generate ressentiment, because of the discrepancy between the ideal and the, and, and, and persisting inequality, uh, which of course can never be overcome. So that's why we need priests, we need social scientists, we need people like Scheler who are going to manage, govern inequality in the name of the regulative ideal of equality, which can never be achieved. Uh, all that you will not find in, in Nietzsche. Um, of course, he, at some point he makes some remarks. He, in terms of his diagnosis of the present, he's not that different from Scheler, but the genealogy is vastly different. And this is precisely what allows him to look further than the present um, and also see um, well, e how even an egalitarian culture could, still, could spawn something interesting, something, uh, something else, how leveling is not, a, not, not, not just a problem, so to speak. Everything is always ambivalent for Nietzsche. Nothing is, is there's no linear causality anywhere. So um, everything can always be turned against itself. Um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm just beginning to answer your question, but you can- no, you I can... think it's good. No, I think that's helpful. And I think it also explains why Scheller's very interesting text, which came out in the 20s, 1920s, right? Uh, on her sentiment was such a striking um, effort, which I mean, basically allowed for um, bourgeois Christians to find a, a type of solidarity with Nietzsche. Because what he tries to show is that in fact, the, the compassion towards the weak, the um, the uh, high ideals of Christianity do not, in fact, historically have their origin in the, the um, slave morality. They, they, they are noble, right? And he tries to show that. Um, yeah, they don't actually, stem from egalitarianism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. And this is this is actually one thing that is uh, concurrent with Nietzsche himself. Why, why is Pascal uh, so favored by Nietzsche in his late years? Precisely because Pascal yeah. uh, uh, was doing something, in fact, close uh, to what Nietzsche uh, desired, which was to preserve something of the rank order of a particular form of Catholicism, which itself was actually quite authoritarian and um, hierarchical, and in that sense, you could say noble, even though that category is a problem. But he did so in this uh, paradoxical way of a kind of joyful affirmation, right? So immediately you see that Pascal, like Nietzsche, gave what Lukács calls a, a, a militant bourgeois ethics to, to, and of course, Lukács's 
uh, claim is that for, uh, w w immediately following Nietzsche's death in 1900, the class of intellectuals leading up to the First World War and even after it, considering that um, even someone like Bertrand Russell called the Second World War, Nietzsche's war, uh, for that period from 1900 to the 1940s, uh, Lukács says that Nietzscheanism could be adopted by both the right and the left. But what mattered was the class position of the intellectual adopting it, uh, because what it allowed for was that paradoxical embrace of the status quo through the uh, joyful affirmation of a great rebel and so on. Uh, which is why, yeah, you're right. Um, Scheller was influential for bureau bureaucratic intellectuals. Whereas for Deleuze, take, to take Deleuze, for example, uh, Nietzsche provides a, mod a way of, of uh, intellectual life that's non-bureaucratic, that's beyond institutions in some sense, right? And you could also, I, I tried to make the association there to modern accelerationism and Nietzsche as a kind of uh, godfather in that sense. But but I, I don't want to get too far off from the, the other question I posed to you, which I find very interesting in your work regarding the problem of equality. And I see your point that originally, because even in Kierkegaard, as you point out, Kierkegaard has a notion of Freisantemont, which is A, not connected to the class struggle at all, but rather to a changing um, period after the French Revolution. So in that sense, Kierkegaard, and maybe you could say something about it, also has a kind of, um, it's historical conception of resentment, but it also leads to the notion that resentment is a, let's call it a generalized condition of modernity, right? And that's very interesting because that means that um, anyone could fall sway to resentment in some sense, you know? Uh, and that's Kierkegaard. Nietzsche kind of specifies yeah. more. Yeah, so maybe you could say something uh, about that. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 Scheler was not like that. Huh? Scheler was much more specific. Scheler would Scheler's book is basically a defense of the values of Wilhelmine Germany and uh um and the kind of uh a kind of yeah romantic act on on liberalism <clears throat> um and he would just see ressentiment everywhere but not among the yeah not among the conservatives at least or, or, or the the conservative revolution of which he would be was to become a part uh, he would see it with women dwarfs social democrats uh, etc he coined this notion of restantiment criticism for leftist politics who always complain but don't really want to solve problems because that's how they did the problems legitimate their own position etc so he, he has a very pedestrian understanding of of uh, of ressentiment uh, he, he certainly does not have a very ontological understanding as a of ressentiment as like the, the the general condition of modernity at large. Although he, he's he's aware that it could be some turn out like that. Uh, Kierkegaard, I think, is more radical in this regard. He, uh, he of course famously distinguishes between the uh, what are the terms he uses the active age and uh, the Re passive age. Re reflective. Yeah. Yeah. The reflective age, uh, and then he, he, he says, well, we have become, he doesn't use the word ressentiment, but he uses the word mise en delse, which is usually also translatable as envy, but it has not, not much jealousy or comparison, much more with, yeah, a kind of uh, um, a castrated form of nationality, yeah, not, not so distinct from what Marx is going to call the the icy waters of egotistical calculation. Um, uh, Kierkegaard gives the example of uh, not even a, uh, even a suicide today, uh, you know, actually commit suicide through the act, that they commit suicide through contemplating, uh, considering, deliberating about, about the act instead of doing it. 
Um, so that's what uh, Kierkegaard finds uh, and at some point. So he, 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 he diagnoses a whole kind of proto-postmodern culture uh, where nobody really takes a stance, is able to take a stand for anything anymore. Everything becomes very relativistic. Everybody hides. It's a, it's a culture of inauthenticity. Uh, it's a culture of no more passions. And he describes this as, as a certain thing. And that's very, of course, he gets very close, close to Nietzsche. The difference is um, that maybe, maybe well, whereas both Kierkegaard and Scheler and later on Girard and others talk about a general condition and in a way generalize this condition to the extent that there's no escape. Nietzsche is always, um, his whole enterprise is basically to distance himself from this sort of mm -hmm. general pessimism, right? Mm -hmm. How not to be a pessimist. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this sense, uh, he can be, he's an extraordinary emancipator. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How yes. not to be a pessimist. And that, that, in a way, medically, that translates, of course, in that famous uh, thing, idea of for protecting the weak from the strong. Uh, uh, to protect exceptions, to speculate on the exceptions to teach us somehow always, I don't know, uh, find the, the meaning of culture in the way it is overcome. Um, mm -hmm. The meaning of discipline is, in the end, uh, something that exceeds it, right? It transgresses it and, uh, and, and that uh, is, not, is, not, is not part of the general account um, or the general subjection that, that is inevitable for Nietzsche. Um, so yeah, this culture of exceptions, or this philosophy of exceptions, this this eye for exceptions, this training of the genealogical eye, as Nietzsche calls it. Uh, I think that's something that that is very inspiring still. And for me, uh, this has become the method. Right? This is the way in which you can criticize, um, let's say certain pessimistic forms of psychoanalysis like Freud mm -hmm. and right, civilization and its discontents, for example, or Scheler's uh, kind of, anyway, Tocqueville, Scheler, uh, all, all these accounts um, based uh, um, yeah, the, the loss of nobility under modern conditions. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. I think, I think that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I interrupted you. Sorry. Um, no, no. Um, so, but it, so I think that's the big difference, even between Dostoevsky and Nietzsche, for example. Like Dostoevsky yeah. is extremely important for Nietzsche in 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 defining the concept of ressentiment and also seeing it as a general condition. Dostoevsky himself said, "What I'm just says, what I'm describing here is a is a type, the type of certain age, which is." Uh, sort of behind us now, which is, of course, nonsense. <laughs> He's describing his own embodiment of that age. Um, and um, yeah, but but in the end, uh, the description is never enough. Mm. And there's always also uh, the quest for what does not fit it, but for what goes beyond it, for what... Um, yes. Uh, I think that's um, I think that's good. I, I would want to bring in psychoanalysis here because you know in the theory of Oedipus, if you take a line of thinking that I have some sympathy to, which does a similar historicization of our present time, then uh, as does Kierkegaard. I mean, think for example of La the Christopher Lash's culture of narcissism. It is a precise historical claim regarding the stunting of certain constitutive mm, processes, stages of development that are regressive, brought on by cap changes in capitalist uh, life, right? Um, in that sense, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can say late capitalism for someone like Lash, but many others, and I don't even want to uh, celebrate Lash. I'm not interested in that. But let's just consider his argument. Because it's close, you see. 
to 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 Kierkegaard in some sense, right? Uh, it's an age in which this generalized condition must be avoided. So then you can see you formulate your politics off of um, the avoidance of falling victim or sway to this condition, which he names which he names um, pre edipality stunted Oedipal thing for which you need tradition, right? For which you need family, for which you need uh, uh, a strong social democracy, a strong welfare state. But then let's pause and look at this from a different angle. I have a good Lacanian friend who told me a story about the Netherlands, which you may find interesting, which is young people today, actually, because the uh, social conditions of where you live have greater egalitarianism, he said that they also have higher suicide rates than less egalitarian societies. And he speculates from a psychoanalytic standpoint, and you tell me if this is vulgar or crazy or wrong or maybe correct, that part of the rationale for that uh, and uh, internal um, despair is attributable to the lack of proper aggression, aggressive outlets. Because again, from a psychoanalytic standpoint, and Lash would assume the same, the problem of the narcissism piece is that the certain stages of aggression cannot be worked through. The rivalry remains. Hmm? That's the stunting. So it's about a kind of management, not, not in this case of suffering, as much as it is of constitutive aggression, which conditions of general egalitarianism uh, threaten this or, 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 or make it more difficult to, to, to have outlets for changing the society, ultimately revolutionary outlets. So he always shares this example with me and the person I'm speaking of is a self-avowed liberal. And I think it's a very problematic uh, case study. But I wonder if you, if you, what you, what you think about that uh, reflection. <clears throat> yeah, I, I have a few things to say about this. I'm trying to access my notes, but I can't because when I access my notes, then the, con the connection immediately stalls and I don't hear you anymore. So I'm going to have to <laughs> talk from, uh, from memory only. Um, I mean, I, empirically speaking, could be some truth. I know that, for example, Belgium is still a much more egalitarian country than the Netherlands, and they have a, a still much higher suicide rate than, than we do. Um, so in that regard, uh, it, it could be. Um, whether it has to do with uh, aggression, not finding an outlet, I mean, I can also see that, for example, protests in the Netherlands, if you compare them to France or Germany, which are less egalitarian countries, they are much more soft. They are, they're very, yeah, they're kind. They're, they're I don't know, they, <laughs> um, a bit um, placid <clears throat> generally. And uh, so there's, there's definitely, uh, and the Netherlands is a deeply depoliticized country. And it is precisely in such a country that the discourse of ressentiment has always been very strong. So when um, Pim Fortuyn, uh, the first great populist rev uh, revolution in the Netherlands in the early 2000s, uh, he was later in 2002 murdered by, um, <clears throat> by someone. Um, when he, he broke through, you had people rehashing arguments made in the 30s about the rise of the nationalist social, national socialist movement in the Netherlands, saying that, well, what we have here is like a sort of a tragedy of democracy, right, where emancipation kind of collapses under its own success. We have uh, pampered citizens who, yeah, they, they no longer know what to struggle for. They uh, take offense about the, the smallest inequality, the smallest, um, so they become narcissists, right? It's a generalist, a Marxist, a narcissist uh, condition. And here, here we can easily make a pivot back to Nietzsche and last man. <laughs> yeah, of course. So exactly. We're all Nietzsche, last man, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> uh, the problem, of course, uh, oh, there's many problems with this kind of uh, discourse. 
um, from an Asian point of view, this, this argument typically is based on the idea that envy, the envy triggered by regulative ideal of equality, uh, generates ressentiment, kind of reverses Nietzsche's notion where ressentiment is kind of the raw resource that is gradually organized, managed, turning and becomes hegemonic in the form of a culture of egalita egalitarianism, but in itself uh, is not egalitarian. Right? The, the first priest of ressentiment, the so the, what Nietzsche calls the Jewish priest, uh, is, is not an egalitarian uh, form of politics. Right? It, it's basically you want to punish the other, reward the self, but it's exclusive. It's about a, an exclusive brotherhood, etc. There's no egalitarianism in Paul. Okay? All that comes much later. Let's say the universal, universalization of certain resentful, resentful claims comes much later. So this discourse is when they every time they invoke Nietzsche, uh, it's kind of silly. Uh, that, that, that that is precisely one of those moments, as you said, where where uh, yeah. Um, I don't know exactly what your words was, but but it's easy to see how how Nietzsche is, um, let's say, um, kind of a domesticated, uh, turned into some sort of liberal uh, liberal uh, critic, uh, philosopher. Um, yeah. So so that is, that is all. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was sorry to say briefly, like you really see this with Francis Fukuyama, End of History and the Last Man because one thing that bothers me about liberal Nietzscheans is, you know, to the extent they provide a periodization of political life, you know that it's often driven by uh, the theory actually of boredom, right? And even uh, Peter Sloterdijk kind of does something similar, right? Which is that, uh, you know, modern liberal democracy um, Kind of, kind of well, you know, precisely. Uh, the the people have this um, this this general um, crisis of um, the precise dynamic you just mentioned, and it's spawned from um, the fact that let's say the ordinary outlets, and here Fukuyama is a very optimistic and naive because he wants to say well the modern stockbroker or like the competition of the free market, very American libertarian position is inadequate outlet for the, what he calls the megalothymotic drive. Right. Right. Uh, it's funny that which, the implication of your friend's argument uh, about social democracy. It's very close like, in a sense. Yes. Yeah, so this is, yeah. this is the, the liberal Nietzschean uh, vision of history which I think it's interesting. I mean, Alain Badiou, who I studied my PhD with, he told me something very interesting once. Where he said the moment, you know, event of May 68, which for him is the very center of his philosophy of politics, transformative event and so on. He said something like uh, fascinating. He said that uh, there was no crisis in capitalism in 68. And then I was immediately thought, well, wait a second, does that make uh, Badiou a voluntarist? Because for him, it's all about this uh, organizational necessity, right? It's not a vulgar classical Marxist sense of crisis that drives the history, right? And nor is it necessarily the condition of extreme suffering that drives history, right? So, so yeah, I, I guess my question is sort of, how do we get beyond this liberal Nietzschean uh, historicization of kind of boredom moves history, right? Um, you know, in some sense, there's something to it. But at the same time, I, I also, um, I think that it's deeply flawed. Um, you know, it's something I'm still working through, to be honest. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I mean, the question is so pertinent that Going back to Nietzsche is not enough, <laughs> because this is really a, a question of, of, uh, of practice, praxis, um, rather than just um, a philosophical analysis. Um, <clears throat> uh, one way in which I have theorized this, though, to, to, to stick to what I've 
done in this regard is to show that uh, um, contemporary attempts to sort of sanitize or separate out more authentic forms of anger, usually invoking Audre Lorde or uh, uh, you know, people like that, defending some form of uh, uh, rage or hysteria or whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, against those who just see narcissism and identity politics and whatever everywhere, or what, what Vinnie Brown would call it. What's the word again? Right. Oh, when you prove that, 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 that we find uh, everywhere. I think the more recent work of hers does, but uh, I don't think she gets. Yeah, sorry, so we we lost, you, think... we lost you briefly there. Sorry, you were just uh, the the term. Uh, I was that arguing that, sure. that even when somebody Brown like uses. Brown, Still, still very much participates in his general diagnosis of uh, of, a, of a narcissistic predicament that we somehow cannot get out of. But then, in response to that, you have all these defenses of anger, resentment, indignation, as some kind of uh, as something that uh, can be distinguished from ressentiment that is more authentic, that is actually rational or more authentic than ressentiment. Um, I am I am very skeptical about those those um, uh, attempts, because the, then you get back into a liberal discourse. Uh, e e even the problem of social justice is very difficult in this regard. Uh, it, it, I don't think it's a concept you will encounter in Marx, for example, and there's probably a good reason for that. Um, uh, or to, to rely on the distinction between uh, le politique et la politique, there, there's a what you find in Nietzsche, at least, as a way to think beyond this kind of liberal Nietzscheanism, is uh, a way of thinking the political event as an exception to this, yeah, to to to, to politics as it is generally conceived, mm. um, uh, as as um, something that has nothing to do with a rationally or justify socially justifiable anger as long as it is proportionate or you know sincere enough then or or as historically justified etc no it's about something else something that escapes from history something indeed that is what Baju is looking after of course when he says that yeah. 68 does not reflect the crisis of capital um there's that that's also a nietzschean moment in in Baju, right there's yeah even an elitist moment in my view, if you, if you want to. Yeah, and, and this is why this this is also why in Baju the category of arist aristocratism itself is eligible to be transformed, right? Uh, at, 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 uh, precisely through the inclusion of egalitarianism. Hmm? Yeah, which is why yeah. he 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 basically hyphenates that. Now, um, I've always been uh, skeptical of his effort but but it's it's complex because on the one hand i admire the effort to say that marxism should care about justice that marxism needs to reinterrogate equality in the wake of the triumph of liberalism which we live in which has like we said before successfully eradicated equality so therefore yes a Marxist today can say, well, Marx was so critical of egalitarianism. Here's uh, his debates with LaSalle. Uh, uh, here's what he says about uh, the, the, the origin of the concept. Uh, it has no place in Marxism, for which my response is always to say, well, when you take that dismissive position on egalitarianism, effectively, you have done something which does not pose a threat to hegemonic liberalism. This is my this is my question, which is why egalitarianism must be wrestled with today. You know, I wonder if you if you if you agree, um, in some sense. You know. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm not sure if Nietzsche is going to be very helpful in this regard. Uh, sure. Uh, but but my what I've tried to do is to sort of situate 
the connection between ressentiment and egalitarianism within a liberal interpretation of Nietzsche and a, and a very long winded development uh, that in a way Nietzsche already foresees, but it is not necessarily part of what Nietzsche, Nietzsche's interest in ressentiment or rather disinterest in ressentiment consists of. Mm. Um, mm. And so, so the question of egalitarianism is not necessarily what I, what I return to in my mm. book. Mm. Okay. Uh, it is, it, yeah, in a way, it's not part of the, the. I precisely show that it's not necessarily part of the question of ressentiment. Uh, in the end of my book, I return to Jean Améry, yes, who, who, who does not claim, uh, it does not legitimate his ressentiment as a as a Auschwitz Auschwitz survivor, in terms of some kind of liberal defensive resentment or whatever. Now he's going to say no. I fully assumed it completely self-undermining, fully pathological, neurotic position that I <laughs> that I am. It's just that my very presence and my insisting on this uh, is going to make a difference. It's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm like going to be like this total singularity that, that, uh, that, uh, that basically blocks um, um, any idea of, of, of generality, so to speak, to prevail. Uh, in that sense, he's singular and universal in the Bajusian uh, yeah. sense, I would say. Um, and, and for Amiri, also very clear, uh, ressentiment, and that's why he's so close to Nietzsche, but not to Nietzsche's inheritors, has nothing to do with equality. <laughs> it yeah. really just had to do with um, uh, the impossibility of legitimating uh, suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, and equality, egalitarianism is only one regulative way of managing mm -hmm. and, and interpreting suffering. But mm. but 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 you know he, he stays very clear from that. Um, so there is something. I, I mean, Perry Jameson, uh, Dan Zizek, uh, they find in Améry's take on ressentiment precisely something like the politics of the universal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And even in Fanon. Because and then also in Fanon, because exactly. Fanon, did you know that another title to his text, "The Wretched of the Earth," could be "The Damned of the Earth," uh, which is interesting because the category of the damned is itself something we should discuss precisely because it is um, perhaps okay. After everything we've said, let's say we accept the the polemics of resentment fanon actually gives one method for um how uh, recognition of subjectivity overwhelmed by resentment can be worked can be addressed can be worked through and so on yeah and i yeah i wonder if you could say something about about that Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm not familiar enough with the argument. I mean, I, I, I know that what he says about ressentiment, but um, um, I think I, I uh, finally there, I, there, it's actually De Deleuze, who uh, after writing on Nietzsche and Spinoza, then in his book on life, it's I mean ressentiment and uh, Leibniz is more or less the Jansenist concept of damnation, uh, where the damned are those. Well, they're not punished for what something they have done. Uh, it's uh, uh, Leibniz approaches it from the perspective of imminent justice. Damned are those who damn themselves because they have only one effect that they indulge in that they cannot get out of that they keep repeating that their, their only way of relating to the world is through the hatred of god that's like the, the only effect they have so the damned uh, are never damned leibniz says but they are eternally damnable because they constantly damn themselves so in, in a little bit of an associate way, associative way we could say that uh, this is leibniz's version of uh, interpretation of what uh, Etienne de la Boite and Spinoza call uh, voluntary servitude. Uh, how do you work your way out of that? It's extremely, uh, uh, for, for Nietzsche, I think it's impossible. Um, and that's the problem with Nietzsche, of course, that uh, he doesn't localize ressentiment in any specific class or race or, or gender or whatever, but necessarily, but 
So he doesn't empirically say, you know, you're you're doomed, you're downed. Um, but it is, it is but but it, but it still is uh, something that um, that you can never get out of. Um, Leibniz says, even at the day of judgment, when the damned souls are reunited with their bodies, they don't know what to do with it. It will not allow them to expand or amplify their relation to the world. All that they are left with is the, is the, is their negativity and nothing else. Interestingly enough, it is uh, Isabella Stegers, who in her book on capitalist sorcery, who makes this connection, who develops this connection then again from Leibniz's understanding of damnation, to what she calls the, the, the minions of capitalism. Uh, those who snigger at anybody who thinks, who dreams of another world or, uh, or any, any, any form of utopian thought, right? It's, so the, the, the minions are the contemporary cynicism, you know, in the sense of form of damnation, a form of self-damnation, mm -hmm. capitalism, realism, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, how to deal, how to work through with that? I, I don't, I don't really have a good answer with this on mm -hmm. the, uh, about this because, but it's because I'm a little bit less familiar with psychoanalytic takes mm. on on this. Um, um, I, I I know I, I, I rely on Melanie Klein, of mm -hmm. course, in her understanding of energy as opposed to gratitude. Gratitude, we can. We can sort of theologically reinterpret that in terms of damnation and grace. Um, but the reason why I have never really dealt with psychoanalysis as much is that, um, well, first of all, uh, I'm very wary of a psychological understanding of ressentiment. I think yeah. Freud, is, uh, the, the materialist basis of Freud is what we can rely on. But as soon as, uh, yeah, this is going to be like psychologized, so to speak, um, it, it becomes very, very complex. Mm -hmm. And this is also what I see in psychoanalytical discourses on ressentiment. Uh, it's usually a form of narcissism. Mm -hmm. Usually envy or jealousy or whatever comes first, so comparison comes first. So you have a very different discourse, which is much closer to which is much more adapted to to Christian priestly discourses than than what what uh, I think uh, Nietzsche and also Améry uh, mm -hmm. find in ressentiment. Mm -hmm. um, Améry has no illusions about working through his ressentiment. He mm -hmm. says, uh, you know, Schiller and Nietzsche were wrong. I, there is no uh, my ressentiment is not going to revolt. Or my revolt is not going to become hegemonic. Uh, you know, I'm I'm going to die and I will be forgotten. Right. Um, right. And so health is never has never been at risk. Yeah. Um, no, I think I think that's interesting. Yeah, because I was uh, I have a, a a section on Huey Newton, uh, the one of the intellectual founders of Black Panthers, and mm -hmm. you could say that Newton realized something close to 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 Amari or to Fanon, but at a, at obviously at a collective level. But the issue there was a recognition in a very sophisticated dialectical way, by the way, great reader of Hegel, great reader of Nietzsche, especially uh, for Huey Newton. The question was the radicality or rather the lack of radicality of um, resentment. In fact, uh, black Americans uh, 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 their, their, their resentments were sublimated in the false ways, false ways. Yeah. So it's, it's about a rerouting into more radical libidinal investments. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so that, that becomes the, the mantra of, of what now people think is silly of consciousness raising in a, in, in a Marxist sense is how do you, how do you reroute revolutionary resentments? And I think that that is what what uh what uh, the class struggle is about and even scheller even though he's quite reactionary is very correct that a uh, modern modern resentment is very much a, a petit bourgeoisie phenomenon it's uh, something located at the site of a contradictory class most often which yeah. means that if you do see a condition hopefully the expansion of proletarian radicality, you can rely reasonably 
on the 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 intensification of resentment precisely from that class. So 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 it's not that uh, the the workers in this case are necessarily of resentment. It's rather that they would they would spark and intensify that for bourgeoisie and middle bourgeoisie classes if they become activated. And that, I think, is a certain lesson that Marxists should take, you know, uh, uh, about the kind of navigation and the minefields of, of resentment politics, if that makes sense. But listen, um, thank you all for your comments, by the way, in the chat. I actually want to be uh, fair because I know you have to go pick up your daughter. I don't want to create a, a crisis there. Shall we break now and maybe come back and continue this conversation when your book comes out, perhaps we can continue part two. I would love to. I would absolutely yeah. love to. Yeah. Maybe uh, in between we can also read your book because I'm, especially yes. after this uh, last hour, I'm extremely interested in uh, in your take and uh, because you have uh, you can worry you have a very original, very heterodox approach to to ressentiment. It's very interesting. Same. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you've 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 really I, I cite you all over my book in this section on resentment because you've you've given me so much the the especially the the um, distinction with resentment as well as the Leibnizian uh, point is extremely useful. So I just want to thank you for spending this hour and a half with us, and thanks to everybody that uh, that has been watching. We will definitely have you back short, my friend. And um, I wish you all the best. Happy happy holidays to everybody. And probably we'll see you in 2023. So. Can I make one remark? I didn't realize yeah. there were chats, uh, comments in the chat. So I didn't yeah, yeah, look yeah. at them. <laughs> yeah, we're, li we're live. Apologize. We're live. Apologize for that. No worries. We're yeah, gonna, let's see. I'm going to remember that. And we're going to incorporate them in our next conversation, which I very much look forward to. Thank you all very much for attending. Wonderful. Okay, everybody. Goodbye for now.